You're listening to Two on One. Welcome to the Council of Clark. Absolutely not. Am I joining that? No. <laughs> then I guess we're God's favorite idiots uh, talking about the show God's Favorite Idiot. I'm the Reverend Arthur Stewart. I'm the Reverend Stephanie Kendall. Uh, we are God's favorite idiots. But as we uh, talked about last week, I, I, I think I'm okay with it now. I, I think that the, the God's favorite idiots, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think uh, it's a moniker that I'm willing to try on. I I think so. And and this episode, episode four of this show, the the halfway point, we not only saw Satan come riding in on a motorcycle, flipping off a baby, but we also met the divine, uh, which was kind of fantastic. I loved this episode. I have so much I want to talk about. But before we do, I want to talk about our sponsor, Jeff One Row Designs heard of him i heard that he's uh making what 17 years of ordinary time extraordinary with incredible liturgical textiles are what who did you hear that from <laughs> god's favorite idiots <laughs> that's right uh on behalf of god's favorite idiots and probably jeff Wonro's favorite idiots as well uh you can head over to jeff and see a variety of stoles pyramids altar accessories banners frontals copes miters Chaka? <laughs> Chasabels, uh, uh, if you know what those things are, you know that they have to look good. And Jeff Wondo Designs not only makes them look good, he makes them well. Could you imagine a shoddy Chasabel? I can't. Uh, <laughs> shoddy Chasabel may or may not become my drag name. I kind of <laughs> that's a really good drag name, and or our if we ever go in, if we ever start a band. Ooh, yeah. I like it. Okay. Anyways, Jeff Wonro Designs. You can go to Jeff Wonro, J E F F W U N R O W dot com and see the variety of liturgical textiles for every season, for denominational use, for non denominational use. Really, if you look at something and say this almost works, but I wonder if we could do blank, there's customization options because Jeff Wonro Designs wants to work with you to make what you need mm -hmm. to make. Creative. He's curious. He, it's, it's not just, um, a buy off the shelf it's not i mean he does have things that are really easy for him to just ship on out to you but also he cares about the work he does and he cares about where his work shows up and how it shows up which we all should um and so all of the customization options are a result of a conversation with you uh and yours about what do you need why do you need it and how might uh the collaboration of ministries come together so please partner with Jeff Warner Designs in your ministry or the work and life of your ministry. Head over once again, jeffwonero.com and use our discount code 21115. The first eight characters are letters. The last two characters are digits for 15% off your entire stole order. And make sure to tag us at 211 Project uh, on any of your unboxing videos and, uh, and make sure to tag Jeff as well. Let's get those unboxing videos going. We would love to see what you get, and we would love to get what you see. Wait, yeah. I don't think it works out well. I mean, I'll take a present. Yeah, absolutely. I would like presents also. Hey, episode four was a present. Can we talk about it, Speck? Um, yes, Timothy. Um, I love anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy, is that what we call him? Timothy. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Tom. Not Timothy. That doesn't make any sense. But Timothy, uh, which is such a good throwback to. The office when uh, Michael Scott asked Jim, Jim, can I call you Jimothy? Um, and it makes my little office heart sing. So, but it was so good. I was thinking about something since our last episode. Tell we me. talked about how this is like, this is the, this is lay theology. And yeah. please don't get me wrong, there are lay leaders who are theologically far more deep, accurate, marvelous than most clergy. I'm not trying to create some sort of divide, but there is the feeling in this that. They're like Googling scripture as they write the episodes, if that makes sense. Like there's a lot of supposition in the show. Michael Shore mm -hmm. did The Office and Parks and Rec and especially The Good Place doesn't Google as he writes. Michael Shore probably is an expert in philosophy, thanks to The Good Place or his writing staff is rather. We get diabology and Satan. We get God manifesting and uh what is it a theophany in this episode we get a whole lot how are you doing with it um it i think it might be my favorite episode yet yes uh, i it, i love is uh is it leslie bibb is that her name um who is satan i think it's she's so good um it also it also makes me go like oh 
women as Satan, but then I was like, white woman as Satan, this track so hard. Well, literally, um, she invites them to have a glass of white wine, and the I response know. from Amelie is, I don't drink Karen juice. <laughs> it is so good. Uh, I I love it. I think that there's a lot of church here. I think I will stick to what I said last week, which is that I think that we're on an ordination journey with uh, Clark, and I think that he's coming into his kind of like latter years of youth ministry his first year was like faith s'more you know like a, here's come have s'mores and talk about god uh you know trying to just get people i think that he's now in a season where he understands a little bit more of the people he's called to care for right did you ever did you ever struggle when you were in seminary and doing youth ministry of being like how do i teach theology or theodicy the 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 problem of evil to middle schoolers you know no, what? They, they were they were my my um i loved my youth but as you know the the theology of uh of what is good and evil was not a problem with my youth what's up fcc mac town i remember those kids at that age Mm -hmm. And I love them all now. They've turned into such lovely humans. Um, and a lot of them were really lovely humans. And a lot of them went through a real challenging phase while I was there. The, the, the latter half of seminary is always uh, a, a friend of mine at the time. I texted her and I was like, hey, what are you up to tonight? And she texted back. I'm sitting in the tub listening to Kanye morning my Christology. And I, I, that, I that that that. That tweet didn't uh, didn't age well. No, because then Kanye decided he was Christology. But in two thousand like nine, two thousand ten, it, it oh, was fine. Yeah, yeah. But yes, yeah, uh, sometimes yeah. you take some hits. So what does it mean for Satan to actually be tempting? What does it mean for God to be so ambiguous and mysterious? God doesn't give answers. Well, and here's a question that I thought. So uh, for those of you that I mean, hopefully go watch episode four, come back. Uh, but so you'll have seen. She shows Satan shows up. She is just trying to be like, hey, let's be girlfriends. Like, what's up? Um, and and they have been given the explicit order: don't leave your house or the route you take to work. Because you've uh, been Harry Potter. Because you've been Harry Potter, which is <laughs> such a good verb. Um, which just meant that they were protected from Satan's doings. Um and and there is temptation there because uh, it seems fun. And I was, one of the questions that I like literally paused and had to think of was if we're doing Christianity right, meaning we live into a space of abundant grace, we give opportunity for growth, you know, we lean into the spaces of community, we're relational. Should we give Satan a second chance? Or a 10,000 okay. chance. I don't know. I think God redeems all of creation. And I think Satan is created. Um, and I, I think the apology on it is is this or that. I I, I will say this. Um, so, and, and this is from Dungeons and Dragons, and I'm a-okay with that. There is the, uh, the columns are lawful, neutral, mm -hmm. chaotic, the rows are good, neutral, evil. Satan is lawful evil. That is, Satan wants to prosecute every offense to the fullest extent of the law. Uh, Satan has no room for mistakes. Satan has no room for error. Satan has no room for weakness. It's not that Satan wants to celebrate sin. It's that Satan thinks Satan can punish sin better than God ever would. And that's why Satan wishes to be in control. At least that's the diabology I understood from it. And I really like the whole like lawful evil aspect. It's also why I like the connection between Satan and the, the stereotyping of Karens, because the whole Karen Kevin thing is it's white people trying to enforce rules on people of color, usually, always, or acting in such a way that they themselves would not ever tolerate being treated. Mm -hmm. And they do so from a place of, but I'm only trying to help. No, you're only trying to harm. Yeah. Um, so sure Satan but, as the rule follower is such a uh a wild and accurate like description or descriptor of all of this that it's like 
you know, so much of our world is divided right now because people are either following rules, not following rules, following rules they think they should be following, you know, like the, this abundance of structure uh, and lack of curiosity leads into the divide that inevitably, at least in this world of God's favorite idiot, puts you on the side of the devil. And I, I think, I think that God is, is gracious ultimately means God, God will chuck out the rules in order to say, Hey, I like you. 1000%, which I mean, that kind of happens, right? Uh, We, we meet God in this episode and what a meeting it is. Uh, It's a really direct, uh, beautiful gospel that we are given. Like Clark asks, what am I supposed to be doing? Because he is herding cats at this moment, right? He's got people out like. He literally says, what exactly is the message? And in episode four, so I'm sorry to come into this because I want to play on the the youth minister ordination journey for a second, but I want you to finish. And I'm sorry I cut you off. No, I just, I think that that's right. I think at the end of your time in seminary, you have gained so much. You have grown so much. And sometimes it's a bit overwhelming. And I would say even now as pastors, it can be a bit overwhelmed. What is the message? What are we at? What are we doing here? Um, it's such a simple and great question to ask. Um, and, and God, and if we're willing to listen, God has said it time and time again, but here, you know, uh, she shows up as his like year three, um, nurse. yeah, nurse and says, God is real. God is good. You know, and. What, I, I, what what almost made me burst into tears i like you and i like you yeah i was like i started to write the what it down but it's just like i like you like what what would it mean and this goes back to our last episode about talking about you know how do we normalize miracles and i you know we came into it as you lean more deeply into community and the acts of god within community what would our world look like if we just turned to each other and said, I like you. One of my favorite questions asked from the pulpit is what if God really is all loving? What if I have uh, one of my very favorite things and I used to have it written down. I don't have it anymore. But um, when I worked at it uh, at my old job in my first career, um, there is a, a wonderful editor named John Pickle, shout out Pickle. And uh, one time we were at the bar and I was in a new relationship uh, with this guy who I was just sitting over. We were having fun. It was lovely. And I'd worked with Pickle probably for five years at this point. Um, we'd known each other a while, but like we weren't friends. We were just friendly colleagues, you know, like. Like you and I were before we started doing this show. Yeah. Maybe there's a, a, a podcast for Pickle and I yet. No, but, uh, but so one day we're at the bar and because it was a Friday and we all used to go after work and he turns to me and this is later in the evening. We've had a couple and he just goes, my favorite line ever. He goes, I don't really like care for you. Like, I don't mean, he, he's like, I, 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 I just, what do you say? He says, I don't really care about you. That's what it was. I don't really care about you, but I'm glad that you're happy. And it was, I turned him, I started crying because also I'm a little drunk at that moment. And also I'm a crier. So who's to tell what (laughs) six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, And I turned, I just told him, I was like, I think that might be the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I live in anxiety and in constant fear that everyone hates me always. And for lots of different reasons. And to have someone actively say like, I don't particularly care about you in like the grand scheme of the world. Like I'm not his close buddy. I'm not his wife, you know, they, but like, I like that you're happy. That was the line. I don't, I don't really care about you, but I'm glad that you're happy hmm. has stuck with me in such a way that I now try and share with people that I don't particularly care about that I'm glad they're happy or that I notice something shining from them, you know, or whatever it might be. Right. Like and, what, what if it's okay for people to just live their life and the, the best thing you can do is just be like, you're loved. Yeah. 
yeah. I mean, and that's what I've always taken from. Like, I weirdly think about that moment. I don't really care about you, but I'm glad that you're happy. I'm pickle a lot because when I read got like all of our texts that say like, love one another, it does not say that you have to shoulder their bird and carry every last meal for like do everything. Yes. You should make community as best as it can be. Like you don't have to care deeply about them to, in, to appreciate who they are, to enjoy their happiness, to know that they are a beloved child of God. And for that, you love them. Um, we, we put too much emphasis on the like other, right? Like that, that love has to mean something very specific and expansive and all of that. And it does it. Like you don't have to care about someone to love them. And it, right. And, and acts, courageous act, the courageous act of loving someone in the moment does not mean that you have to perpetually, eternally, deeply, and without exception, love them forever. It yeah. means that in the moment in which it has happened, you must so love boldly. I completely agree. Yeah. And so that uh, I was just like, I, I, that whole moment, I was very much like, oh, this is, not, this is a pickle moment. Like, mm -hmm. I like you. This is uh, now, granted, I hope that God cares for me too. So it's a different dynamic of relationship. But I was just like, I, I don't know. I just, I really liked God saying, I like you. Me too. But do you need God to tell you that the universe is kind of like a baklava and not a spanakopita? Yes, always. I love baklava and I love that line so much. I it kind of messed me up. I'm not going to lie. Like I've, I've, I've really, I've tried to make baklava before and it's incredibly hard. So um, hard. And then like, and I, I mean, if there's ever, this is just a helpful hint for everyone uh, who may or may not ever bake. If it ever calls for puff pastry or if it ever calls for um, phyllo buy dough, yeah. buy it, buy the frozen stuff, use it. It's not worth making your own puff pastry. It's not worth making your own phyllo dough. And even then you do layers and layers and layers and layers and layers. And it's the hardest thing in the world. And I just love the idea that God, that the equation of the universe is baklava. Mm. Because it's not in the difference between the Spanakopita, right? Spanakopita is, it's cooked. It's, 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 it's finished. It is a whole thing and then wrapped around things, but baklava being layered and time consuming. It, it was, it's a beautiful and uh, delicious metaphor for what we're doing. And Spanakopita is essentially like a lasagna hot pocket made in Greece. Yeah. I mean, it's delicious. Don't get me wrong. Oh, it's yeah. just, um, but you want to know the thing that made me go, oh, this is 1000% church. What's that? Is the story of Clark finding ten dollars and spending sixty-seven to find the owner? Uh, so for those of you, that, yeah, 57. huh? He spent fifty-seven because one of the ten-dollar bills he gave back was the one that he found. Okay. But they said sixty-seven dollars in the show. Somebody was going to be pedantic like I just was, and there you go. Uh, but yeah, I I loved that he he trusted everyone so uh implicitly who said that was my ten dollars i lost ten dollars that he gave people ten dollars um out of his own pocket and he spent seven dollars to make a flyer did you lose ten dollars and it was so it's such a good story about not necessarily worrying about the outcome but making sure that everyone has enough um and also church costs money it just does. It is. We do not work for a nonprofit. All we talk about is profit and loss. Um, and we hope that that includes conversations around grace and community. But I, I don't know about you, but like PLs are are is a class that should be taught in seminary. <laughs> yeah, I think we could probably cut one of the like nine history classes and do a accounting class. Uh, Yes. What's up? I know there's people at two of the disciples uh, seminaries who listen to this. Maybe you could bring that up. A two and one. <laughs> and we don't need church history one or two. Just kidding. Kind of. Um, and I love church history. So, OK, yeah. I would like to tell a story about the whole life, making sure people's needs are met. As yeah. you no doubt also have encountered, people will contact churches for assistance. Pretty consistent. All day, every day. Yeah. Right. And my, my thing is always, 
the policy that I've found most helpful in congregations is we can, we have the resources to help you as much as we can one time a year, because what has been the habit of some is that if you give them assistance this time, then they'll come back three weeks later and there's another story or there's another need. And maybe it's a legitimate need. Maybe it's not. I always remember one of the desert fathers, like he always helped people. And when he knew he was being scammed, he gave them more than what they asked for. Wasn't there yet. Not a good work of stewardship for the church. So this uh, lady drives up in a car that has a panel that's a different color than the rest of it. And she parks in our parking lot. And I'm like, here we go. I get ready for it. And she comes in and she says, I need enough money for gas to get to the White Rock Food Bank so I can get food before they close so that I can feed my kids this week. And I said, I got nothing to do. What do you say you and I go to the grocery store? I'll fill up your car for you and we can go grocery shopping. She said, well, you don't need to fill up my car if we're going grocery shopping. I said, right, but then you don't have to worry about gas. And she wouldn't let me fill up her car. We go grocery shopping. We're pushing around the cart. She asks if she can get uh, dish soap at some point. And I said, do you need dish soap? And she's like, yeah. I said, again, dish soap. And she actually asked why I went into ministry. And I remember saying to her, I just really hope I get to meet Jesus someday. And she said, well, maybe you're Jesus. I said, well, maybe you're Jesus. I'm definitely not Jesus. And we kind of laughed about that. Kept doing like stuff. Like the Spider-Man but, meme where everyone's pointing. Like, you're, yeah, you're, Jesus. you're Jesus. So we check out. And I help her load up her stuff in her car. And I say, are you sure I can't buy you gas? And she goes, no, you can't. It's fine. She goes, see you later, Jesus. I said, okay, Jesus, bye. And she drove off and she never contacted the church again. And I wish she would have because I wanted to know what happened. And I wanted to talk to her and I wanted to have a relationship with her. And I think that might have been Jesus Christ. I really do. I mean, uh, it sounds like it. Right. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, we, we are inundated with people that come and there are the repeat people that come and people have problems with that for lots of different ways. One, because again, we don't have an endless supply of money. I wish we did. But there is also something that warms my heart when people know that we are a place that can help and they come back because they know that that's a place that you're, you can receive help. And so I don't know. It just, it's one of, it's, it's so challenging, you know, as, as Clark is on his ordination journey, uh, uh, it is challenging to meet the needs of all people. Always. We're not meant to do that, but we are meant to be a community of resources that can. And I don't know that we always do that. Well, Excuse me. I completely agree. <clears throat> But there's there's the line in which it says like, I, well, I don't know if it's a line. I just wrote it down in my notes. I'm looking at notes. <laughs> uh, but what if church people were pathologically honest? Um, because there is that line about pathological honesty. Like Clark is pathologically honest. Uh, he wouldn't have kept the ten dollars. He would, you know, like all of those things. And Samuel, which I think is funny in the face of that pathological honesty says comes to them is like i've got bad news and then clark's like well maybe it's not bad news sometimes when people say it's bad news you know like it's not as bad as you think it is and like or it's not he's he doesn't say i have bad news what does he say he says i have um oh it's not that bad he goes i have some news it's not that bad don't worry like trying to tamper it and then clark's like well maybe he's right and (laughs) emily's like Absolutely not. It, it's always bad. And then he's like, Satan's here. And it's like, it's bad. Like, that, that is the end of episode three. That's right. We talked about it last week and we weren't, weren't sure which one it was, but yes. And that was their stinger to bring in Satan. Yeah. Okay. So mm, watch the last week's episode. No, that's good. Uh, that's, that's pedantry, pe- pedantry again. I'm sorry, but I liked it as a stinger and I forgot about it. Yeah, that. I liked it too. But like, I, I just thought like, what if we were pathologically honest as, as, Christians as people in community, you know, like I think one of the things you and I talk about often about why our friendship works so well is that we are pathologically honest with each other. Um, I would say we're authentically vulnerable, but I guess that's pathologically honest, right? It's sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, whether it's, are, are, are you mad? Did I hurt your feelings? You said this, I felt this way, you know, and knowing that we will get through that. Um, well, I value our friendship enough. I, I will just tell the story about before we started recording, uh, talking about Harry Styles and another cameo at the end of Thor. 
And I was like, right. And the character that Harry Styles plays is super problematic. And Smith was like, right. You just mansplained Marvel Comics to me. I know who Star Fox is. And I said, you're right. I did not mean to do that. I can see how that was. So I will not do that again. And we moved on. We moved on. Right. I and mean, I, I think like, it up again, but I, I'm not doing it because I'm upset. No, you're good. And, but, well, and that's the, I think it, it's less the honesty and it's more the, like the pathological nature of it that I'm in, that I'm drawn to that. Like, what if we are all so honest with each other that the expectation of honesty leads in conversation so that there isn't confusion there, you know, like all of this. It, and I think with Clark and Amelie, then that's what does it. And Clark tells Amelie he loves her. Clark yeah. tells Amelie he hopes she's his girlfriend. Clark and, and Amelie, of course, is supposed to be prickly and, and put off by it. And Amelie is almost confused by the fact that she's lovable and she is loved. Yeah. And I think that I, I, between the two of them, I think we all see ourselves at different points in those different spaces, or at least I do, um, around all of that. And I think that it's... Uh, it's hard because we don't always feel lovable because we do make mistakes, because we do make, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, we, we don't always show up consistently. So, uh, yeah. So is grace, is living in this way of grace, right? So escaping the lawful evil nature of, of Satan. Living in a place of grace, is it being in such close proximity or, and by proximity, I guess, I mean closeness with one another, that like mistakes or mistakes are made or bridges are built in real time that it's no longer a destination it is a journey because the destination is the journey becoming really obnoxiously obtuse yeah well yeah and this whole episode you know it's punctuated by satan which is uh has been pulled in in, in lots of different ways from the devil from Lucifer, like there, there are different layers to, I mean, diabologists, as we said earlier, or diabology, I can't speak today. Um, but it made me question. So all the fun, all the, the things happen around chaos, around, you know, the conflict that is created by miscommunication and, you know, all, all the things in which we all know create chaos um so then i just wrote in one of my notes i was like is god boring oh wow um or is god meant to be boring and the manifestations of our human nature keep it exciting if we are curious to it but is the at least in this world i think the boring nature of god is something to aspire to maybe i don't know what do you thought what are your thoughts as somebody who's always seeking the novel or rather okay as an enneagram seven who has a heightened sense for novelty um there's always the eschatol (laughs) there's always the eschatological issue of like you'll sit under your own fig tree and vine and i'm like okay so then what i do five minutes later um it is a i don't think I don't think God is boring. I think God is peace. And I think peace is the absence of conflict. And I think conflict is so second nature to us mm. that we really wouldn't know what to do, but I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to sit and think on is conflict an intrinsic part is conflict and competition, an intrinsic part of being human. And what would it mean to be free of those things? Would we still be human beings? I mean, isn't that the question I would say, Yes and no. And I think that this comes back to, you know, I think us starting yesterday, maybe, uh, saying that, you know, I'm willing to be God's favorite idiot, right? It's not necessary. Like Clark is someone to aspire to and he's just kind of this middle dude. He's an incredibly average man turned prophet. Um, and I love it. I would say I'm reading a book right now called The Righteous Mind. It's a little bit older. It's from 2012. Yeah, Jonathan Haidt, who would who would absolutely say that conflict is part of our uh, human nature, um, that we need that ex- that excitement, that relational excitement too. Um, and so, if we are created, we are created human, and we are created human with needs for conflict. Uh, what part of that is divine? Mm. If yeah. we are also made in God's image, right? If if the 
Right. And where does where does conflict fit into the great baklava? Where does the great <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> I love it so much because, you know, there's this other kind of theme throughout it is just because it's wrong doesn't make it bad. Mm-hmm. And I think that we are in a season of uh, life these past, you know, years, these past 400 years, these past 2000 years in which uh, laws and rules, uh, which in this world, very much aligned with uh satan and the devil and whatnot but where it uh laws are laws aren't always for the good of the people they don't always serve uh in hope and and joy and in justice it's not in pursuit of that which is righteous uh and it makes that which is not bad wrong and right but the righteous don't sweat so you got to put in the work (laughs) Uh, but I was, you know, it. but uh, just because it's wrong doesn't make it bad. I was telling a, a story a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite travel things that I ever did, which is kind of both wrong and bad and also just silly and stupid, is that uh, one of my best friends, Will, and I uh, lived in Europe together. We lived in Salzburg and we would travel and we went to Greece and we went to the Parthenon and we were so in the like let's make this moment count that we were like you know let's do something right like a little mischievous a little you know we're 20 i think at this point you know we're 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 not all there but we're adults uh which is a why yeah we're adults um living in europe tried as adults we can be tried (laughs) exactly um but anyways uh we were at the parthenon and we hopped over a fence and we licked it and it is something that Will and I talk about and have done. We licked the Parthenon. We got chased by like security. It was it's it is not a the right thing to do. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily make it bad. It just makes it kind of gross. Um, but then also, you know, there is a story. A, a legend has it that uh, in the year of our Lord two thousand and five, uh, at the university, there is a church that leads into. Uh, or that sits right outside the campus gates. The day before graduation, they put up a really homophobic sign and come the next morning, it had been spray painted uh, that said, God loves all. Um, And while I would say vandalism is against the law, the inclusion of other people and the putting or shoving aside the oppressive nature of what that message was and the inclusive nature in which the new message began uh, was not only not bad but good i i think we're entering a good philosophical territory and good philosophical waters at this point uh and we're out of time (laughs) i'm sure we'll touch back up on this next week for episode five of god's favorite idiots as we talk about season one episode five of god's favorite idiot this is your warning right now you can watch it and be ready for this conversation not only to you spiff but to our deuces who are listening i will watch it i promise i'm gonna watch the whole series (laughs) Perfect. Uh, two on one and all of its manifestations, varieties, and flavors is brought to you by Jeff One Row Design, celebrating 17 years of making ordinary time extraordinary. Uh, you can check out jeffonero.com and use our code 21115 at checkout for 15% off your entire stole order. Mm, I love it. If, th- if this uh, episode were an ice cream flavor, what would it be? Pralines. Oh, wait, we're not doing Wayne's World. Uh, if it were an ice cream flavor, it'd be mint chocolate chip. Ooh. All right. I think if it were for me, I think it would be like a cinnamon. Ooh. Those two flavors don't go well together, but you know what? That's why we have diverse taste. It's a beautiful thing. Hey, uh, on behalf of God, uh, these are God's favorite idiots, Arthur Stewart. And Stephanie Kendall. And uh, we'll see you next week, deuces. Bye. Bye. Get more two-on-one at twoononeproject.com.